All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our web chat about Hour of Code. I'm here today with my good friend, Tracy Pilts from Billings, Montana. Thanks for joining us today, Tracy. I asked Tracy to join me because she has been doing a lot of coding over there in Billings with teachers, and I thought she'd be a great voice to the chat this weekend. Or this weekend, see, I still think it's weekend, <laughs> this Monday afternoon. We're still in vacation mode. From <laughs> I wish it was still a weekend. <laughs> um, Tracy, would you tell everybody a little bit about your background and your role there in Billings and um, maybe a little bit about how you got into using coding in, in schools? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my name's Tracy Pilts. I taught kindergarten for 12 years, both here in Billings and down in Arizona. And um, I was lucky enough to have one-to-one -one iPads in my kindergarten classroom. So we just started using um, technology in innovative ways. So um, when the my current position came open, um, I was really excited, I guess, to have the opportunity to work as a tech integration specialist and be able to help other teachers sort of discover um, the joy of using technology in their classrooms too. So now um, for Billings Public Schools, I work as a tech integration specialist. Um, I mostly work with kindergarten, first and second grade teachers and students, um, helping them use iPads and Chromebooks and things in their classrooms. Um, and coding is one of the things that I love to share with them, um, especially working with um, primary age students and teachers, not a lot of them have actually um, been exposed to computer science or coding, even the teachers haven't. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're often reluctant to share that with their students. So I just really enjoy um, going in, showing that, um, you know, we're all learners. <laughs> I definitely don't know everything that there is to know. Um, and that um, you can still get your kids started coding even at a really young age. So I really love doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, so that was perfect. Now, the first question I wanted to talk about is, you know, what is coding? If someone were watching this and they were absolutely no idea what we were talking about, what's your, your basic definition? And why is it important? Why, why are teachers using it now? Yeah, um, coding, I mean, the real basic definition I usually give out to kids is just, um, you know, giving a sequence of instructions to solve a problem. So um, we're doing those types of things already. Um, we talk about unplugged coding, which is coding that can happen without a device. Um, often when I'm talking about coding with teachers, they make so many of those connections already, you know, as we're um, doing tasks in our classroom, we're talking about patterns in math, um, cause and effect in our, you know, English language arts. Often we're already doing those things and we don't even realize it because it's just that um, sequence of instruction solving problems. And so um, I think teachers and students always kind of have that little like light bulb moment like, oh, we're already doing so much of this. Um, and again, that's why it is important is it really does um, kind of feed into all of these other things that we're, we're doing. It um, really ties into so many of our curricular areas. Um, the career aspects when you talk about computer science, um, looking at data, you know, specifically here in Montana, all of the open computer science jobs, how um, much our students need um, to learn this, but how few of our schools are actually teaching um, students to code and teaching them about computer science. So even just looking at jobs on the horizon um, and knowing what's out there and exposing kids to this so that they know that that's a career option for them, I think is super important. Um, and then just again, the um, kind of social skills, the problem solving skills, the critical thinking skills, all of those things are developed um, by having to solve these problems and having to um, try something and 
what do I do if it doesn't work? I have to now kind of rethink, go back, um, tweak that a little bit, debug what I did, um, and give it another shot. And so those kind of grit and perseverance and those types of things that students learn from this and teachers, <laughs> I think are um, really incredibly important. Yeah, I mean, those, it's all the buzzwords, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's grit, to <absolutely>. perseverance, <laughs> iterate, you know, it's everything. If teachers are looking for a way to have a specific task for problem solving and critical thinking, this just mm -hmm. covers all of that stuff, absolutely. Um, so what, think back to when you first started, um, what got you started? What, what, what brought you to coding? Well, um, it's actually a funny story because I was in um, a professional development group called TILT, um, and it's something we do here in Billings. It's teachers integrating and learning technology, um, and you apply as a teacher and you're accepted into this program and it's a three-year program. Um, and at the time I was learning from Desiree Kasky, who is amazing. Um, and she every, so it was three years and we met six days every year and each time she would have an agenda and coding would kind of always be sitting on that agenda. And myself and the people in my group, we'd go, ah, I don't know, we're not sure. I don't think any of us really knew what it was or felt comfortable. So it was one of those things that always kind of got slid. Uh, we'll do that next time. And the next time we pushed it to next time. And finally we were in our third year and she said, I'm not letting you guys out of this program <laughs> unless you let me share coding with you. And so um, finally uh, we spent some time with her as teachers um, learning just some real basics, some apps that we could try with our students, um, and really understanding the importance of um, at least giving our kids the opportunity to um, be able to learn coding and at least try coding. Um, they don't know if it's something that they want to pursue or not if they've never had the opportunity to at least try it. Right. Um, and so that was really powerful to me just because maybe I didn't feel comfortable with it or if it, it wasn't something that I had done in school um, doesn't mean that my kids didn't deserve the opportunity to, um, you know, get to kind of tinker around with it and see if that was something that they loved. Um, so after that experience in Tilt, I did um, my first um, coding with my students was during Hour of Code, um, which we're kind of right on the brink of here. Um, and so I just had my um, students use an app called Codable um, mm -hmm. and just sort of started to play around and um, mess around with code and kind of understand. Um, I was pretty upfront with them and I said, I am by no means an expert at this. We're definitely going to be learning this together. Um, some of them surpassed me very quickly and sort of became the experts in our classroom and it was really cool to see them be able to shine and if another student got stuck, um, you know, they were kind of our go-to um, person. Oh, you know, go over and ask Nikki, and maybe she can kind of help help problem solve with that and that sort of thing. Um, now that I know a little bit more about it, I wish that I would have started with some more of the unplugged types of things. We just kind of um, dove right into coding on devices, mm -hmm. um, but there are so many great, um, you know, all the makerspace and STEM and robotics and just kind of unplugged things that they can really get their hands on and do. Mm -hmm. uh, I think now I would pair a little bit more of those unplugged um, as a beginner and then, okay, you know, we did this. Remember when we coded each other around the carpet yesterday, now we can do that, that with this app. So I think I would um, make a few more of those connections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a similar start. I saw a bunch about it on Twitter. I mean, and it was, the, uh -huh. you know, hashtag kinders can code. And, and right. I was thinking, what does this even mean? <laughs> um, and I, I was fortunate. I had a, our technology library position was currently the person who's doing that was a former computer programmer. And so I enlisted him to come and I said, I want to code with these little <laughs> K1s. Will you come and help me? And I was sure I needed him. Like right. he was my, my support, you know, I needed <laughs> him. And what I, I looked at it and we also wanted used Codable. But my first thought when I looked at Codable was this is a game. Like they, 
they're going to love it, but they will not know they're coding. They'll just yeah. think they're playing a game. And so I ended up coming up with this unplugged activity where I took a piece of poster board and I glued down blue strips of construction paper to look like the little mazes that the little fuzz balls rolled <laughs> okay. through. And I bought actual physical fuzz balls and then I cut out little paper arrows and I okay. had them play this paper version of the game where they laid out the arrows in the direction that they wanted the fuzzball to go because I was sure that if we weren't really intentional about explaining to them what they were doing, they would just play the game and never know what they were doing. And so sure. we did a lot of what is computer program, you know, a computer doesn't have a brain, um, you are the brain. Um, they coded Mr. Greenwald to go out into the um, hallway and get a drink from the drinking fountain and had a great time as he ran into the wall because they coded him wrong, you know, <laughs> things like that. Um, and I would agree with you that what I found was I was terrified. I don't know anything about computer programming. I'm still not an expert coding. Um, but what I found it was, it was really that thing for some kids in my room, especially kids that didn't hadn't at that point shown me anything that set them aside you know they were great readers they were great writers but I didn't see anything that made them that seemed really unique until this came and then it was like oh my gosh this kid gets this this is his thing you know and suddenly he could be a leader among his peers um, or kids that didn't read or write very well could could code you know it was such a cool activity and again for the perseverance and having them work through it it was um so I was once I once we started doing it it was just the best part of our week it was so much yeah. fun that's awesome well and I do think you know the other side of that is there were students who didn't love it too and I think mm -hmm. that's okay um I went to a code.org training last spring and I think one of the most powerful things that they said is you know it's not for everyone yeah. but they don't know if they like it or they don't like it if, if they've never tried it and a lot of times we're offering it as an option maybe when they get to middle school or high school but by that time um, they may have self-selected out just because they don't know what it is mm -hmm. um, so just giving them that chance to play around with it a little bit and find that you know some, for some of those kids like you said this is their thing mm -hmm. they wouldn't have known that if you hadn't given them that opportunity and maybe when it came up in you know eighth or ninth grade they wouldn't have even chosen to do it because they didn't even know that that was something that they loved for the um, same that reason that you didn't about. want to learn about it during your training exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right exactly so that was really powerful to me is just you know they don't know you know kind of like try try that spinach or whatever we don't know if we don't like it unless we've tried it so it's important yeah, to you. yeah it's why we teach them basketball and take them cross-country skiing right. and, you know we yeah. they'll there are kids that hate those things too I was one of them <laughs> <laughs> so I, but yeah showing showing and I think it's important I, we're in such a technology driven world everything has an app or some kind of a, a, a coded device knowing Understanding that how those things work is just part of living in the in a world with technology. Yep, absolutely. Uh, so our next question: So how does someone get started? Um, when you work with teachers and billings that want to take this on, where do you where do you take them? Um, this is a great question because I do think often just as we're talking about, they're a little bit intimidated and nervous. And so maybe that's something um, that they'll ask me to come help them get started with. And then once I'm there, they see how easy it would have been to um, do on their own, even though I'm happy to be there. Um, but really there are so many options. I know we're gonna share um, some of those resources with you in a, in a moment, but there are just so many um, options depending on what kind of devices you have. Um, if you, you're looking for something web-based or you pick an app, um, there are so many good free coding websites or coding apps um, that it's really easy, I think, to get started because it's not something, if you have the devices, you don't have to invest money in buying a program um, or buying apps. If you don't have access to devices, um, like Nikki and I were saying, there are a lot of 
unplugged. Um, you know, there's so many great board games out there now. Um, yeah. Coding your principal or your, um, you know, teacher around the room or your um, friends around the room. I mean, there are just a lot of great um, kind of unplugged sort of resources too. Um, Code.org has tons of um, free unplugged lessons. So um, if you don't have devices or enough devices for all of your kids, um, you know, don't let that stop you because there's plenty that you can do without having the access to devices. But um, really just pick, you know, once you look at this list, um, I would just say pick something and just sort of dive in and get started. Um, and really, again, kind of have that learner mindset I think the kids love it when you say to them, like, this is something that's new to me. I'm really excited to um, learn it with you. You know, you guys might teach me a few things. Mm -hmm. I think that really excites them that they think they get to teach their teacher something and just diving in um, and giving it a try. Mm -hmm. I think I send everybody to code.org too, because I really think it does a nice job of offering a, uh, just a, a real scaffolded approach. And there's something there for everybody. Um, there's a Star Wars game and a Minecraft game and a Frozen game and Angry Birds. And so, you know, it grabs the kids based on those little characters that they like so much and then takes them through. The directions are right there. It's self-paced. I mean, you really don't. <laughs> you can really yeah. just get them all logged in and walk around talking to them. Um, once you just get all their accounts set up and everything, it's, it doesn't take much at all. Yep. Absolutely, that's a great place to start. Um, so we talked a little bit about code.org. Where else do you go for coding resources? What kinds of things do you like to use? Um, I use yeah, a few. So I'll bring up our pages here. Okay, perfect. About, I'm gonna go past some of these slides. So um, this is uh, a K2 stuff. What do you like from here? Oh, perfect. I, um, I did use a lot of Codable. Um, with kindergarten, that's often where we started. There's another free one called Daisy the Dinosaur that's very basic. Um, that's another one that we used. Oh, yep, another one that we used um, often in kindergarten. Um, and then another kind of one of my go-tos is, um, it's, I think now, you know, they change the names to these apps all the time, but I believe now you can find it under Code Spark Academy. Um, and it's a kids coding app. Um, and that one is really fun for um, first and second grade. It's got these fun little monsters on it. Coding app for kids. Yeah. All right. Bring it up here. This is a new one for me. I haven't seen this one before. Yeah, this one's great. Um, and you can put the app on. Um, if you sign up, so it's looking like, you know, you have to do a trial, but it's always free for educators. So if you um, sign up as a teacher, it's free. You get a whole dashboard where you really do get to kind of watch their progress, see what they're working on. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is a great app. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, I agree. I do really like code.org as well. Um, and they just sort of redesigned their curriculum. So it's much easier, I think, to follow um, as far as grade bands. Um, I think at one point, I just wasn't really sure where to jump in with my kindergartners, but now it really is um, set up pretty well. So I know that, you know, course A is kindergarten. I can start my kids there. It's gonna be scaffolded. Um, and then it kind of spirals around as far as if they continue using it, you know, through elementary school. It does have a really nice mix of unplugged so that they're doing some hands-on things, getting on devices. There's some great pair programming so that they can be working with partners um, and sort of collaborating and problem solving together. So there's lots of really great stuff here and it's all free. So for Hour of Code, we would go here. Um, we come to this main page, code.org, yep. and come to Hour of Code. And this was just, you know, getting them started and letting them yeah. choose one of these. Is that, right. is that what you have teachers do during that time too? Yep, I typically do. Mm -hmm. And for those that don't know, Hour of Code is, 
it's really just uh, a, a week in December, right, where everyone is trying to commit to having their kids do an hour of coding. It doesn't have to be a continuous hour. It can be 20 minutes, you know, three times a week. Um, and it's meant to be just a taste. And if you were gonna try it out, this is the time to do it. And you can print off certificates for your kids when they get it done and make them little stickers. And a lot of local libraries or different nonprofit organizations will have events around this. And it's just meant to really raise awareness of computer science. Um, I think December is a great time to get started. It's just, you know, you've got the, the doldrums of winter coming on and you've got the excitement of, of Christmas in the air for elementary kids. And this is just something new and different to engage them and get them excited. Um, one thing I'll ask you, because you know this site pr pretty well, I get lost a little bit here. Um, if I'm a teacher and I'm looking for lessons, mm -hmm. um, where, where should I go? Um, click on, so I usually sign in, so it's looking different to me too. Um, I think they've got a whole new banner up here because of Hour of Code. That's not typically there, but if you create a free account, okay, um, you'll kind of see at the top of the screen, it should um, allow you to set up a class and you can set it up um, if you have older kids or have students that are comfortable logging into Google, you can set it up, um, connect it to a Google Classroom um, so that they can pretty easily sign in um, with younger students. So you can, you know, up here at the top, you'd set up a classroom and then you assign um, a course. So if I'm teaching kindergarten, I'm going to assign course A. If I'm teaching first grade, I'll assign them course B and so on. So create a section. Oh, okay. So I've got picture logins, word logins, or personal logins. Okay. Um, it's not an app. So um, if you have iPads, students still just access it through a browser. So I'll sometimes put the little you know, clip on the home screen so that they just click on there mm -hmm. um, and are able to log in. But yeah, so you could do either a picture login or there's a secret word login, or you can just connect it to their Google account if they're comfortable using that. Mm -hmm. um, super simple. It just takes a minute to set up. Um, and there's so much stuff there. So if you click on course A, if you click on view course. Okay. And then kind of over on the side here, you can see we're viewing it right now as a teacher. So mm -hmm. you can view the page as a student or a teacher, but oh. then all of the lessons, um, you can click on the lesson plan from the teacher screen and it walks you through, I mean, there's so much information here. So if you click on view a lesson plan, I mean, it'll tell you exactly um, what you need to do. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. linked to um, computer science mm -hmm. standards, and so they, you know, typically list those in here, but really um, break it down for you. So it's pretty friendly if you are feeling a little bit um, nervous and unsure. I mean, this really, really does really spell out all of those steps. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I've seen this before, and I... So, you know, I'm like any other teacher. I look at one of these lesson plans, and I, I've never taught anybody else's lesson plan from start to finish. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice of them to write it all out for me, but I, I always have to uh -huh. try it. Um. <laughs> I'm more of a just sort of like jump in and give it a try. And then later I read and go, oh, oh I should yeah, have done that warm up. That. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but we figure it out. <laughs> yeah. But I like these tips here. Uh -huh. um, you know, it, I get overwhelmed by all the text on the screen. <laughs> the vocabulary is nice too, uh -huh. just because it's not necessarily vocabulary like even we as teachers are comfortable with, and so yeah. kind of highlighting some of the vocabulary is nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I love this idea. So this is this one has a marble run um, mm -hmm. where they're they're going to be building and creating something, um, and then using language like debug the run. And I think that's really powerful. So great example. Um, so just jumping around here, what other resources that we have listed here do you think we should share about? Um, Scratch Junior is a, a very popular app as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I haven't looked 
specifically the PBS Kids. So what's the difference between this one and the PBS Kids Scratch Junior? Yeah, like, that's a yeah, great question. So this is Scratch Junior, and this is created by MIT, um, which is the kids version of Scratch. Uh, Scratch is the, the grown-up coding version, and it uses what we call block coding, where the kids drag these blocks into the workspace and fit them together like puzzle pieces, um, and then they create their own storylines, they animate characters, and uh, make them talk, make them jump, things like that. PBS Kids Scratch Jr. is um, a PBS version of that same app, also created by MIT. Um, also free for your um, tablets to download. And the difference is that now kids can code their favorite PBS characters. So okay. we, can, we can code, code pig plus cat um, to do things and we can make the wild crats chase animals and we can change the background so it looks like um, from our PBS programming. And then the piece that goes along with, and this isn't loading very well, the piece that goes along with the PBS Kids Scratch Junior, if you just, in your Google, put PBS Kids Scratch Junior, there's a curriculum that goes along with this. And again, a nice step-by-step -step resource for teachers to use. And this is, it's gotten broken up into these scaffolded activities. And so you'd start with the tree problem, and teach again, I'd never teach this lesson exactly as it appears here, but um, it starts by playing a game of red light, green light, only you're using the blocks from the program, pictures of the blocks from the program, so the green flag is your, is your green go, um, paired with what the action blocks look like in the program, so you would hold up the flag and the action block and they do it, but if you don't put the flag there, they don't do it. So it's just teaching the importance of starting on the green flag. Another unplugged activity. But the fun part about all of these lessons is that there's a 15 minute video in every lesson where the characters are having a problem and after they watch the video, the kids code the solution to the problem. So it's a really nice tie to PBS content. Uh, in this one, Peg and Cat get stuck in this tree. And when you get done, you have to challenge the kids to recreate the scene on the app using the background and the characters, put them in the tree, and then code that solution for coming down. And then they, they are supposed to share, this is what they might look like, um, share what those solutions might look like. And so um, they can have them talk and they can record their own voices in there. So it's a really fun app using characters that like the Star Wars and Frozen care things on code.org um, that gets kids excited because of the characters. And I also find teachers love this curriculum Mm -hmm. because it's very easy to follow. Tell them to start with the first one and just do them in order. They all build on each other, and so the last ones are a little bit harder. Then there's nice videos and how-to cards over here, a lot of resources that are free and easy to use um, to help them use this, cool. this app. So a lot of fun for that one. All right, let's look at... Though we've talked a little, those are like app-based things. And we've talked to, what are some of these web-based coding tools that you like? Any of them? Um, well, again, so code.org is web-based. So that's probably mm -hmm. the, my go-to when I'm um, working on the computer. I usually go to code.org. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't used CS First. Have you? Actually, we were just sort of laughing because both Shelly and I ordered these kits and they're both sitting on our, <laughs> on our tables because we're like, oh, this is so cool. We want to use it. And we just haven't had <laughs> uh, No, I've not used it either. Um, this came out pretty recently. Yep. Uh, I just maybe a little over a year ago. Um, yep. Want to hold it up for everybody? Yeah, they sent me this whole cool thing. It was all free. And they sent me like this whole packet of like getting kids started using this. So there's like these passports and this one is like storytelling. So it gives them, um, I guess, problems and then they would code um, 
I don't know, there's solutions to these different, but it has a whole guide in it and little stickers and passports and things to give the students. And I could see that would be super motivating yeah. to students, right? Now, was that free? You just had to sign up for it? Yeah, I just signed up and, it, and they sent it to me and there were different, I picked the storytelling one. Uh -huh. um, but there were different packets that you could choose from. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I don't know, it seemed kind of like a fun little yeah. resource, but. I think what I like about this is that it takes coding into other areas, maybe it even breaks it out of the STEM field a little bit into language arts, the arts, fashion design, sports, um, all the different game design, all the different places where kids might be interested in coding. Um, right. The one I looked at was this create your own Google logo. Mm -hmm. um, and it all starts with I guess a video that they can watch mm -hmm. um, and then some instructions on how to specifically change all of those different things. So it's a, it's a video and some tutorials. I talked to a teacher today that said she had used it. Um, she said that sometimes it's, it tends to be a little slower paced for those really advanced coders. Um, so I, I think you probably have to know your students and how much coding they've been doing um, and have them choose projects that are, that are, you know, a lot of kids now have been coding since kindergarten, you know, there's probably fifth graders that have been coding every year. So they're, some of these introductory activities are way beyond them. Yeah. <laughs> I feel for those teachers that have the kids that I taught I mean, to code five years ago. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> there are just really those so many, um, I think, you know, like you were saying, this is such a kind of buzzy, hot, important thing right now that there are so many free resources provided to teachers that um, it really, I mean, you really couldn't go wrong. I don't think with any of these, it's, it's just pretty amazing how much is available to us, I think. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I think kind of like you were saying with the lesson plan, the hardest part is just sort of picking one <laughs> and yeah. just kind of, you know, jumping in and going for it really, because yeah. there is so much available to us. Um, I always want to share just about the standards. Um, mm -hmm. if, if teachers do have to sort of make the case to admin right. about coding, it really does meet a lot of your standards for ELA, for math, for ISTE, um, even schools adopting the NGSS, um, those computer science standards. And this is, if you click on this link, it takes you to this Ed Surge article that does a really nice job of explaining um, why computer science is, is, is such an important science. So coding really isn't the new literacy um, and a nice, way if you're gonna if you've got to if you're if you're and then montana standards are, are based on the ngss and so if you are trying to meet those and build curriculum to go with them uh, coding fits really nicely into that um i always talk about we talked about hour of code if you're just getting started um it's a great place to just start and just you know pick a pick a platform pick a day and just do it you know and then see what happens um, and that's kind of what happened for us. And then we kind of, once they got good at Codable in my room, we could make that a learning center. Yeah. And during math time, when they rotated through stations, coding was one of them. Um, mm -hmm. And that became a way, way to do it. And then working it into passion projects and just letting them, letting them code on their own and, and take things a little bit further if they need to. And that's where kids who want to go more and do more with coding can and kids that want to actually go and learn how to make memes or something could do something else, you know. Um, do you have any other ways that you've um, taken coding beyond Hour of Code? Um, no, I mean, those were the things I was thinking of. Some schools have started some coding clubs, mm. um, whether they be before or after school. We have a PE teacher here um, in Billings. I just thought it was so cool. She had like some free periods. And so she started pulling kids for a coding club like during the school day, during one of yeah. her free periods. And I thought that was really cool. Um, so, you know, some teachers are doing that. Um, but I do think the key is, you know, doing something like Hour of Code, practicing together a little bit whole group, and then making it something that they can do independently at a center or in a project. Um, that's probably the biggest thing. 
I think after I talk with teachers about coding, they really see the importance. Um, but you know, with every, as with everything, struggle with figuring out how to put this in their day. Um, mm -hmm. So I think embedding it into a learning center or, you know, like you said, making it a project um, that students could choose to do is really smart. I think that if you look at choice boards and, and menus as well, it's, it's a great thing to add to the menu. You know, if kids are choosing the product that they're creating to be the summation of what they've learned in that unit, why not make it a coding project? You know, right. I, I talked to a teacher or, or a, another coach told me about a teacher she's working with that would have the kids read a story and she'd stop halfway through the book, put the book down and have the kids code their prediction for what they thought was going to happen next in the story. Uh -huh. So things like that, there's a lot of creative ways um, that it could be implemented across the curriculum. And it could just be one of the many ways that kids get to show what they know. Yep, absolutely. Um, when I talk with teachers, I'm always really impressed with connections. As they learn more about coding and computer science, they make so many connections on their own. Like, yeah. oh, you know, we're learning about, you know, this in math, and this is a perfect tie-in. Um, so I'm always really impressed with how they just kind of see um, how beautifully those go together. Even map skills, you know, you yeah. think about getting getting a, a kid from one end of a map to the other, you're just trying to do a sequence of directions. Um, and GPS now, it, it all comes together and explaining all of that. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna move through these slides here. So we're kind of, we, I think we've, we've talked a lot about different resources and hopefully just gives you a taste and has motivated you to give Hour of Code a, a spin sometime in December. It doesn't have to be that first week of December, but it certainly can. It's the first week, right? Or is it the second yep. week? It's nope, the first week. week. Yep. Yeah. Um, we've got a little evaluation form. So if you just click on this uh, blue evaluation form, it takes you to a Google Doc where it will just ask for your information and have you ask, answer a couple questions. Um, and then I'll take that information and send you a certificate for one hour of OPI credit. Um, here's our information. If you have any questions and you want any help um, getting started or, or you need any kind of support, we're, we're here to help with that. And Tracy, just before we go, I know you've had some extra training uh, with code.org. Can you talk about that and how you got involved in that if teachers are interested in taking their skills a little bit further? Yeah, um, well, I'm a code.org facilitator, which means um, I'm trained to give code.org trainings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, if it's something that you are wanting to learn more about, um, if you go to the code.org website, you can search um, for trainings in the area. And so when they are scheduled, um, you'd be able to see those dates come up and then you can sign up for free trainings. Um, so it's just kind of an opportunity to really dive into the code.org, you know, curriculum, dashboard, try out some of the um, puzzles and the unplugged lessons and sort of collaborate um, with other teachers. So it's a really great training. Um, I think people just enjoy having the time to <laughs> sort of sit and play and do those things, um, you know, before they do them with their students. And it's all free. And then you get, um, you know, a copy of the code.org curriculum um, to take with you for your classroom. So um, you can just get on there and search for trainings as they're available. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thanks so much for joining me today and for um, having this conversation about Hour of Code. Um, in the comments section or in the description of this video, you're going to find links to this slide deck and to the Google Doc or the Google form to give us your feedback and get your OPI renewal units. So check that description and we will see you next time. <laughs>